this computer. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Good Hello. morning. Uh, good morning to you. Is it morning there? Isn't it yeah. noon there? No, it's it's ten past one. Yeah, it's afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, ma'am. Keep eating my chocolate. <laughs> so yeah, I had um I had a lovely weekend away, and you were also relaxed and rested and ready to discuss. Yes. I did. I relaxed. I cleaned my house. Does that count as relaxing? It was it was therapeutic cleaning. Six hours. Like that is definitely the content that I am there for on your <laughs> it was pretty bad, Julie. It's been a busy week. It really didn't look that bad. I mean, like you you'd probably be shocked at what I'm sitting in right now. Although you probably saw some of it, yeah. Mm, you should just zoom in to my yeah. zoom into my mess. But it took in any hours. event, it's cleaner now. And you feel easier. Good. Yep. So today we're going to talk about two things. One, we're going to do some little bit of chatting about GMI. And then we're going to talk about, we're going to revise pain. <laughs> hopefully, if anyone ends up watching this, which people may or may not, they might um, get some small bits, but we're going to, yeah. Anyway, let's start with GMI. So we recently watched uh, the app to CSM GMI lecture by Jesse Podolak and Jennifer... Put it written here. I'll look and see if I still have it. Oh no, I closed it. Uh, uh, Jennifer Stone. There we go. Oh, yeah. Jennifer okay. Stone. Um, and Jesse. <laughs> Jesse's much more of the kind of um, Noi Group style background theory of GMI, and Jennifer was about its application to the pelvis. Really, really interesting case study. Yeah, it was. It was fascinating. I think that's um, what was really nice is it was it was nice to see someone take what any of us would have thought like, whoa, this is layers upon layers upon layers of of psychosocial distress yeah. um, and do something uh, that would be seen in more traditional as, as a physio input to something psychosocial without using kind of like the Carolyn Van Dyke and psychosocial elements to it and do lots of stuff with it and finding it useful, which was really good. Like and more, even for an experienced poet for physio, I think that was a complex case. Yeah. Yeah. The case was a um, uh, gender non-binary person who was having, was struggling with their femininity mm -hmm. um, from an outward point of view and from a biological point of view and had lots of anxiety and distress behind it, previous traumas, lots of stuff going on yeah. um, and bladder pain syndrome. Yeah, I saw that. You know, which funnily enough resolved completely with some GMI. Um, yeah. So did you wanna did you wanna talk about what you what you gleaned from it? Sure. So I think I'd like to start off, because I know we have a lot of chit chat behind the scenes, but for anyone watching this video, greater motor imagery classically is made up of three components. So you have um, implicit motor imagery, which from a Noi group standpoint they use um, left-right discrimination. And then they have explicit motor imagery, which is their visualization component from first person where someone would choose a series of activities or positions that might be painful and they would practice those without experience, practice and imagining them without experiencing pain. And then they move on to mirror therapy where traditionally, again, you would look at, um, you would put an unaffected limb in front of a mirror watching the reflection. So the brain would perceive it as the affected limb doing certain motions, right? So that's classically kind of what we've called graded motor imagery. And what comes to mind when we watch the video, the presentation, and even what you and I are doing in our clinic is, is that graded motor imagery, right? So when you work with the pelvic floor, is that graded motor imagery? And I'm starting, I mean, I thought it was, <laughs> I was calling it graded motor imagery too, to be very, very fair. But now I'm not so sure that it is because I don't know that we're going through those three series of, of um, I don't know, like kind of factors that they make everyone go through. Well, we, we, had, a, we had a chat with Tim Beams who wrote the, literally wrote the book um, on GMI about this. And I think we're, we're all of the same thoughts that it's not GMI what we're doing. Because GMI has got a very heavily motor compo component and I know that they've kind of, they've updated everything. So they're not kind of very strictly pre-motor cortex, motor cortex integration in those kind of ways that they're thinking about it. Um, but I think in pelvic floor, we're, we're, we're so 
it is such an emotive region it's such a you know it's got a huge amount of um you know our, our, the information that comes from that region yes in your hand you have a lot of um interceptors proprioceptors other stuff going on um it can be a very emotive reason region for people that use their hands in different ways like you know with musicians and things like that however it's something you see every day in the pelvic floor you don't see it you haven't got the visual acuity you haven't got um so we're relying heavily on interception we're have, relying on some degree of proprioception from the pelvic floor um, i agree with that so i think we're coming to the consideration that we're much more in a somatosensory basis um and so calling it something more to do with graded exposure or mapping might be better i just send you a crazy list of things before i went to sleep the other day mapping <laughs> mapping mapping <laughs> you're still trying to find so the words work. <laughs> i was like sure <laughs> one of these words we're still yeah. we're endlessly trying to find a good way of explaining what we're doing um but it isn't graded motor imagery not necessarily we're not, not going to give someone a picture of a pelvic floor and then say do that or place your pelvic floor or three quarters of the range from uh, from you know in three quarters internal range and then get them to do it and watch it that's not what we're going to achieve so well and i think the argument becomes too so i'm a little bit more set up in the vestibulodynia world you're a little bit more set up in the bladder pain world i get the argument for pelvic floor muscles but then you have the vagina, the uterus, and the bladder, which we don't have express, express motor control. Do you know what I mean? So like, where do you, where does the motor aspect come from in that, right? Um, so I think that's slightly problematic as is laterality in the vulva. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, cause you can argue, argue physiologically, obviously we have the ability to lateralize yeah. Um, if, if you know, we've all had patients that have one labia that's on fire and they know exactly where that labia is and they'll be able to tell you the difference between the two labias. But um, doing really careful testing on laterality of the pelvic floor, A, is really hard because how are you, how are you, how are you going to test it? <laughs> so do you um, know what I tried a little bit? I took mm -hmm. a bunch, so I took all my vulva pictures that I have mm -hmm. and I changed them to be 45 or 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. But then I struggled with, should I make it from the perspective left or right or their own perspective left or right? Anyways, I'm struggling with that right now. So I've got them in the NOI, in the Recognize NOI app right now. And I'm playing with left, right, like, and then, and then one of, one of my practitioners, one of my colleagues came in and said, I can't even tell what's up and down right now. <laughs> so. Exactly. And also there's just the, the, the difficulty that actually a lot of people just have difficulty looking at a vulva. Yeah. Um, That's treatment itself, just looking at it. Like yeah. you might not be able to start with an image, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the differences that were, one of the problems, problems. One of the challenges is that there's already such taboo around the genitals that just showing someone a picture can instantly cause more anxiety or pain in someone, um, which can be true. For, and it, it, we cannot we cannot reason that as being it causes more pain because it's flaring a part of their premotor cortex, um, causing them to move an area which they associate with you know with whatever kind of level of dysfunction and noxious nature is associated with it or error. So it will come onto that <laughs> error. Um, error. So, <laughs> You, you can't we can't say why that's happening but we know it is happening and I think what we're doing is we're kind of grading a gradual exposure but and integrating our gradual exposure to somatosensory issues emotive issues cultural issues so much more than just a motor imagery thing so it's it's an exposure but we don't yeah. like calling it graded exposure graded motor exposure yeah, yeah. We're worried about the motor component. Yeah. Well, um, even graded exposure itself, it just, as you said, it's difficult to get funding for graded exposure in the vagina. Yes, it is. <laughs> we could come up with a different term. That would be great. Um, what else did I want to talk to you about here? Uh, I think there's a part of a learning difficulty as well. Mm. And I say this to my patients, even for those that feel like they have good genital self-image and that they don't have um, anxiety associated with looking with images. They struggle just to learn because it's difficult for them themselves to see their own pelvic floor. 
they don't, they're not, they're not necessarily exposed to other women's pelvic floors, right? Or male, female, whatever patients are working with. I can't demonstrate for them. Like there really is, <laughs> there is some, there's some difficulty in actually the learning aspect of this, right? Especially if you're someone who is a visual learner. Which it, I, and I think it's because it comes down to pure use of interception. Okay, you need to talk to me about interoception a little bit more. Introception, interoception. Yeah, I'm, I'm British, so I we, we shorten and make it silly. So we say, I would say introception, like I'm an intercepted person or I'm interceptive, but um, there is an ER in there, so it should be interoception. Um, and you can say it however you want because you're Canadian. I'm Canadian, so I'm going to really go, err. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and smile a lot and be a little bit um, apologetic at the same time. Um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> sorry interception. Um, it's it, the way I think about it is interception is how you feel what's going on within yourself at all times. So right now I am aware that my bum is sat on the chair, that my collar is a little bit tight towards the back and I can feel that I've got a hairband in. I'm also aware that I've just finished my lunch, so I'm a bit bloated. Um, Proprioception is an element of interception. So proprioception is one strand of it, one ability to make sense of my body model. So you've got three things. You've got body model, which is I think of as like a wooden man. Um, so if you're drawing and you, you want to draw someone and you put them in a funny, lovely position, whatever position you put them in, that is your body model. Your body model is long term. So it hasn't it changes very slowly and it's very much in kind of it's solidified within you that I know that the distance from my fingertips to my elbow is that far so when I walk through the door that's what I'm expecting um body model is fixed it changes with puberty and that's why kids must fall over a lot body image is our cultural and emotive sense of um self-expression within our set environment and our cultural environment so that's more to do with um people that uh, kind of have um, you know have morphic changes and morphic issues so um issues with feeling that their stomach is bigger than it is or feeling that their breasts are too small for culturally what they would expect them to want or penis size that kind of stuff that's a common body image problems um and then body schema is what i'm really interested in and i think what you're really interested in is the day-to-day -day constantly evolving constantly um being created interceptive awareness of what's happening everywhere including your guts at any one time um being constantly updated and body schema base works on a predictive model of error um at all times where you expect it to be in one certain state so but so the difference between body model and body schema would be um a sensation of guts so my body model knows where my stomach is all the time knows where vaguely where organs and things are. I've got very good interception because I'm a physio. I've had lots of education, lots of awareness of it. Um, but today my body schema um, is slightly altered in my intestines because I've just had a had lunch and I haven't yet had a bowel motion. So that's how that alters. Um, it all relies on interception and it takes us back to the Haas paper, which I bloody love. Um, such a good paper. <laughs> and the What's the, uh, the paper about it? The little thing online about it was really good as well that Laurie found us. Um, oh. I can't remember what it is. What's the, what's the, oh, it's like an online journal, Relate or Refire or I can't remember. Um, it yeah, it was a little bit more layperson, right? Yeah, it's really useful for brains when you're tired. Um, you know what? Just put it in the text underneath this. I will you find it and put it under the text. Those two papers are great. Um, but it comes down to the understanding of interception um and our ability to intercept so people that can intercept really well um so uh sportsmen sportswomen people that have been had to be in a career or a position where they pay a lot of attention to themselves like physios doctors to some degree although i've met plenty of doctors that have no clue um they tend to be more stress resilient they tend to have, show more resilience in the kind of the way that we've managed and we'd, we'd look at resilience in the long term in their ability to manage trauma. And when you scan them, when you stress them, and then you scan their brain, the brain area of the insula, which is responsible for taking in interceptive information is a lot quieter because they're a lot better at processing the information that's coming into them, even when they're going through a stress, um, which means that their brain is always more able to then be available to process more complex cultural, social things going on. Whereas people with really poor interception don't really know, they can't really tell 
that they're they're probably going to come on their period in three time three days time or um you know they're definitely day two or whatever's going on they shouldn't have eaten that thing four hours ago you know those kind of when they don't have those awarenesses they just kind of feel something and they just feel wrong when you scan their brain area responsible for understanding or regulating or processing what's going on with the information coming in it's a lot more active so it's like there's a huge amount of energy taken up by trying to work out what these informational signals coming in are trying to process them which means that you have less than ability less energy less availability and flexibility to process more complex cultural social economic things going on um, that leaves you more vulnerable to not tolerating stresses which I think is really, really interesting and underpins. <clears throat> I love it. I absolutely love it because I think it's much, much more relevant to pelvic health than other areas. Yeah. Because we've got this huge somatosensory and emotional element to that particular area. So when we do GMI, I believe part of it, a really important part of it is interceptive training. So we're teaching them what the structures are looking, what, what they look like. So they're more able to map what they could feel like. And then we're teaching them to map what it feels like further on with our graded exposures of using wands or, you know, dilators all that kind of stuff. Okay. I want to ask you some practical questions about everything that you just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so proprioception versus interoception. Mm-hmm. Proprioception is more an awareness of where your body is in space. Yeah. Is my understanding. And interoception is more of a realization of internal functionings of your body. So if you've held your breath, the discomfort with holding your breath, the sensation of food moving through the intestines, uterine cramping, that sort of thing, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just want to highlight that because I don't think that interoception is used as commonly as maybe it should be right now in the pelvic floor world. And yeah. I think that you're right because of their, there's so much organ input that the question becomes, are we dealing with organ sensation more than we're dealing with muscle sensation? And I know this becomes a little bit problematic when it comes to scope of practice and how we need to chart things. So I do try to keep that in mind as well. And I think that's another reason why we might see people always write down pelvic floor muscles, pelvic floor muscles is because mm -hmm. in, a lot of, in a lot of areas, that's all that you can write down. But I think it is important. Um, and one of the ones that I think maybe has been talked about a little bit more in the pelvic floor world is that sensation of pelvic organ descent, mm -hmm. because that's not the muscle that they're feeling. They're feeling the organ descent. And we see some people who have quite a significant stage prolapse and they might not feel much of anything. And others who have a very, very minor laxity in their, in their vaginal wall and they can feel it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I think that that's an easy one to relate to for therapists to think of as examples as to how we want to separate proprioception versus interoception. Does that sound right to you? Because I'm that still sort perfect. of okay, It's so a really, really nice way of doing it. Um, yeah, absolutely. But it also, and it also encompasses things like blood flow. So there yeah. are some patients, I mean, when we've queried before, and I don't know how it seems, it, it's a bit like the old age old debate about pedendal neuralgia, which I think is a lot rarer than people think it is. I think we have central sensitization and we have visceral sensitization within the pelvis are very, very frequently. And pudendal neuralgia is a thing. Um, I, I don't think it's very often at all. Um, but when we have people with vascular issues, what am I thinking about? Like pelvic, pelvic congestion, congestion syndrome? Yeah. Um, and they really can become aware of changes in, you know, changes in heart rate they'll then feel within their pelvis. They'll feel a pulse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question too. Where the where you're discussing the Haas paper, and we should probably put the title down because I think it's an I think it's an open access paper. I think people can read it, and yeah. they were using um, respiration as their model for interoception. So they're having people in an MRI tube perform cognitive tasks, um, while getting them to do breath holding tasks at the same time. Yeah, I think they they had a mask on, which um, limited how easy it was to breathe in for yeah. forty seconds at a time. So quite a long time of <gasps> trying to get your air in. Yeah, um, where it showed that, so what I'm curious about, because we're talking about kind of someone's skill level for interoception, mm -hmm. being that if they're more interoceptive and they found they're more resilient and therefore had less factors associated with chronic pain, what do you feel like people who are almost too interoceptive and they have almost an, um, too much of an input in their system? Because I find that there's a little bit of that as well, right? 
there is some of the research is showing almost the opposite is that resiliency was one of the scores in the Haas paper, but they were looking at people who were almost like hyper interoceptive, being more in tune with their, with maybe the painful signals associated from um, different sensations like that. Have you thought about that at all? Because that's what I've been thinking about this weekend. Yeah, I mean, because it, it could go both ways. Um, but I think what we're talking about in these cases is people that have become sensitized. Okay. So I think um, you're, you're absolutely right. And we may find the opposite. It's, you know, in everything in medicine unless you've got 15 papers in it and lots and lots of research we can't say that that's it um it's just a really nice idea um but i mean I, the house paper was it was repeated a few times i think yeah. it was repeating something that people have done quite a few times so we, that's why we, i like talking about it but um yeah you can get those hyper vigilant folk however I, I wonder if that is the sensitization talking as opposed to true interception so the the premise of the premise underlying the house paper and why I got really excited about that kind of work because I'm getting into PhD interception nerd territory um is they they theorize interception at maladaptations as a basis for the maintenance of pain states long term so if your ability to intercept is adjusted in a in in a negative way as opposed to a positive way because we're always plastically changing could that be the reason that you continue to have pain because your body schema saying you know i'm bloated it's because i had a sandwich i mean i don't eat that much bread but it's so nice um so i'm a bit bloated and if for some reason my interception uh was hyper vigilant or it was it was off and it was wrong that bloating and my perception of it could be altered in a negative sense that might mean actually I've got I'm too stretched therefore I'm at risk instead of just being slightly bloated and I might therefore have no perception firing off and a you know and some kind of error in my body schema what is expected right now versus what my body schema is maladapted to tell me from my interception from my, you know what's being put together I get this error this error is ongoing because actually the receptors aren't they're they're hyper vigilant they're overworking or they're under vigilant they're working in the wrong way constantly. So I'm getting a an, I'm getting a mismatch between what I expect and what is true, true given the data I'm taking in all the time. And that error continues. And that's the basis for the, the pain experience that I'm having. So that's really, really cool. And I think so it can very easily go both ways. Um, and I would, you do. And if you think through your chronic pain patients, and this is just an experience thing, you get those patients that are just in so much bloody pain all the time that everything's kind of, a smudgy blur of one bad and then you get those patients that will tell you that the third freckle from the right two hairs yeah. upwards is really painful yeah um and i think it's just it's just a maladaptation in interception in both those cases would be a really nice way of discussing it and um looking at changing it which is what we're trying to do with gmi yeah which is not and I think that explanation that explanation holds water because you'd think about it the same way for sensation right like oh. tactile skin acuity right someone yeah. some can have chronic pain and they have a very poor representation of that and someone can have chronic pain and have a hypersensitization of of skin acuity right so I think it goes from a proprioception point of view which all physios <laughs> are very very happy with you know if I broke my arm when I was like five um pre pre-fracture I probably had a hyper Pre, um, pre-treatment, I probably had a hyper-awareness where I could tell you exactly what degree of bend and flex, flexion we're in. Post being in a cast for a long time, my interception, my lack of use of that area was really poor. I couldn't really tell you when my elbow was straightened so much so that I can now over-straighten it, which is a bit gross. Um, so yeah, interception, proprioception also goes through those um, maladaptations or adaptations over time. Okay, good. Thank you for talking about that with me. Because I feel like I keep going back to my brain struggles with understanding proprioception very well. And then I keep having these thoughts about interoception and I need to, I need to I, I fix the error of, between my, in my brain. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the error is the error's not there. It's just, it's all quite hard thoughts until you talk about them lots, isn't it? Which is why we're talking today, because you help my brain work as well. Um, I keep going around going, oh, I need to learn my interceptors. And then I go, hang on a minute. It's everything that we already know. You already know them. Yeah, know. it's just blood pressure, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any more questions on that kind no, of stuff? No, I'm good okay. with that. 
So, I, and that's why we have endless problems with the graded motor imagery, because I don't think it is. It's a mapping exercise in the pelvic floor and viscera. It's an interceptive exercise. Um, Huge so component of education. Education and educational ability ties nicely into um, the use of the insula and other kind of brain areas. And if we haven't got cognitive flexibility, which I've been going on about and teaching for a long time, and I'm really happy that so far I'm not wrong because <laughs> everything else moves on and you look at yourself and go, oh Christ, I was talking about that three years ago. Um, but cognitive flexibility, ability to use your brain in the way it was deemed, you know, using lots of different areas in different ways and your ability to adjust and do that is really important. And when you're in a pain state, you tend to be quite fixed, not in your thinking, but in the processes that you use to process things. So, right. and I think that's where the plastic, the nociplastic aspect comes in, right? And that's why I think too, just graded motor imagery has been around now for 20 years. If right? not more, maybe 30. I think, yeah, it could be more than that at this point. Okay. And I think that the physios are from the 90s. That's right. It was mid to late 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. We're getting old. Um, and everyone is starting to feel very comfortable with that concept. And I think that's why we're using that language. But as we've spoken before, language matters. Um, yeah. And it does change how we approach things. And, and uh, I think we should have a good understanding of the neurophysiology behind why some of these treatment methods are successful yeah. while others are not, right? Yeah, we're not, we're not going to motor chain train the bladder to empty. Right. I mean, we are. <laughs> That's, we might That's not confusing that. at all, Julie. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the end point of us doing some of the stuff that we do is that the bladder might empty more frequently, more comfortably, or less frequently, or whatever, or the bowel might empty more frequently. But it's not going to be because we've shown people pictures of it. It's right. going to be because of a complex anyway, series so, of events. Yeah. Yeah. So we need we need to come up with we we have been probably for what nearly a year now. <laughs> trying to find different words for what we're doing um and I think probably maybe we, let's do let's do something like let's put a time limit on it by the time I finish my PhD we have to have <laughs> a yeah words words for words what we're doing. we have to have words I would hope that, that a PhD life. would allow for words yeah yeah not many words okay so that kind of yeah so that the the app to we both really enjoyed it um, the after presentation, I definitely really enjoyed Jessie's explanations. Um, she did a really great job. Both of them did a really great job. Um, they did. Fab teachers. Yeah, and they're very. They've got. They're, they're very easy to listen to as well, which is yeah. they've got a skill there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with uh, some of the stuff that they were saying because I think uh my brain since doing Mick Thacker's course with you last year has changed quite a lot in understanding and of pain and mm -hmm. I think they were still talking a lot in intentionality of pain so the pain has a purpose was quite important to the the narrative and the thing is that when you're teaching a narrative is really a, a really good way to teach because having a hero's journey you need some aspect of that to get knowledge into people's brains so pain having a purpose and say and kind of thinking um, I need to, you know, you're, you're, you're under threat. So I'm going to give you pain to try and deal with that threat. It's quite easily understandable, but it isn't, I don't think correct. Okay. So I want to just take a time out, time out for a second, because this is what was making me a little bit itchy and I I'm uncomfortable with this thought now, but I can't express why. <laughs> so when you're people chocolate. say, when we talk about pain, we can have you, yeah, just post that over it. Okay. When people say, you especially hear this in some of the apps now, like some of the applications that people can, because there's, there's, there's apps for chronic pain now. When people say, we now know that chronic pain is 100% in the brain. Mm -hmm. Like that makes me go a little like, <laughs> but I can't easily, I don't have a good elevator pitch. Like I can't summarize it in two minutes because I had, you know, we sat through a seven hour lecture <laughs> on, Ampa receptors, <laughs> but I don't magnesium know that everyone plugs and, Magnesium plugs and NMDA receptors. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I don't need to know that I now understand. Yeah. So, Julie how Bond. No, how would you? you pain, one, is chronic pain 100% in the brain? No. Okay. And you're going to explain not? why. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'd love for you to do that. Yes, I will do that with you. You go first. <laughs> okay, let's try and put together a, 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 a patient pitch. Um, 
I think because I'm happy in interception now, I'm getting into interception. I would say something like your body's making, your body is making predictions all the time about what's going on within it and what's going on outside. And that's based on everything you've ever done. So, you know, when you put a foot in front of you, when you're walking on the pavement, you've walked pavements for 30 years, however long, you know, most of the time they're fine. Every now and then there might be a slight raise. So you're kind of, you're, you're predicting where your body's going to be in space. Say you put your foot forward and it hits one of those slightly raised pieces of paving. Um, the information coming into your body isn't the same as what you've predicted. And so what your body does is it tries to adjust for the prediction error. And it can do a few things. It can respond with your proprioceptor sense. Well, it can respond physically is what I'd say. It can respond with something like adjusting your position. So you, you trip a little bit, but you're upright. And it's really good at it. And that's always predictive. When you've got a cut, um, the information coming in is very different to what you're predicting. You, you know, if you're walking along and you cut your arm, um, your body is predicting that you're walking along and it's not expecting any dangers to your system or threats. Um, and then you have, suddenly you have information coming in from your arm that doesn't match your prediction of what's happening at that arm because the information coming in is lots and lots of broken skin and broken bits and, and, so, and um, broken tissues. So there is an error in the prediction and the perception no, perception is wrong. Well, there is. Yeah, there's an error between the prediction and the perception. Um, and this error contains um, information that suggests that that could be a noxious thing, which means a, a bad or potentially a damaged thing. And so you have pain in pa pain is thought to exist in the prediction error. And it's an experience we get when there is a prediction error. So you can take intentionality out of that. Yeah, I'm not said it's because of it's not an output. Yeah. Right. So I think that if we bring this back to the neural matrix theory, the physiotherapists tend to be more comfortable with. Yeah, this is it's not so much all of these sensory cells that are accumulating information going to the dorsal root ganglion, dorsal horn and making their way up, you know, potentially central and sensitization amplifying and making their way up that this is like in the peripheral nerves, there's messaging going back and forth. And then in um, up to the spinal cord, there's messages going back and forth. And then each level of the spinal cord, there can like, it's more bi-directional mm -hmm. than what we were accustomed to hearing before, correct? Yeah, so I, the, the, I sent you the picture that I, I vaguely started putting together with lots of little circles of loops yeah. at the toes, at the fingertips and the spinal cord and the brain, little, little, little predictions. Because you know when we say you're making a prediction, like your toe, the cells around the joint of your toe are constantly making a prediction about what they expect their environment around them to be like based on what it's been like before most of the time. Um, and, and that's happening in the whole body. There's also the stuff about, you know, I, I like telling people that there's actually, you know, they've got brain in their spinal cord. It's not just nerve strips. It's not just wires. It's brain. Brainy tissue. Yeah. You've got brain and then they, you know, they stuffed it down your spinal cord as well. Um, another question for you. You didn't, you didn't answer. No, you can't get another question. <laughs> You've answered as well. Give me your okay, hold on. Elevator. Here's what I, okay. So this is not a good, this is not a good for a lay person, but I'm, I'm scrolling up to my word document. Cause this is what I wrote down when I first tried to like, I'm like, what am I going to ask Julie about? So I have the entire nervous system is processing information and generating information and evaluating its own conclusions on a steady bi-directional basis yeah. to create sensation and perception. Yeah. And the result of this processing, this processing is itself inputted back into the system at a variety of levels. This back and forth evaluation is compared to previous information or our predictions and works to constantly assess errors in prediction and upgrading the system accordingly. And then I have my question for Julie is a large discrepancy between prediction and actual sensation or perception leads to pain. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And that's as far as my understanding is, because we don't okay. understand what pain is. Right. Yeah. No one's been able to like die, put die in the system and find pain. Mm, yeah. What we can find is obviously changes in our neuro uh, neuroimmune system, but we can't find pain. So pain is a set, uh, it is a perception. Pain is pain a response experience. to threat? No. 
Yeah, no, I know, but you know, we, we might be being rebels by saying that. Mm, we are. We Pain might have some big Bane that. people think that we're dum dums. <laughs> oh, it's but so I know, you know I know how painful it is. I can hear our brains working. Like I just, it's it's so hard to explain it. But pain is not a, th a, a threat perception, and it's ridiculous because I, you know, I <laughs> and, until four or five years ago, I was teaching pain. You know, for the last four or five years, I've been teaching pain as a threat perception, and then. Yeah. Um, vaguely jumped just before the pandemic when I put everything online but it's you know so my one of my favorite is Dave Grohl recently just because I read his book and it was really good totally um you know suggest reading it sometimes overall um he so he when he was playing with the foos in like Germany maybe Sweden somewhere like that he jumped off stage after the first song or something and um he tripped rather and he was gonna fall, but instead he decided to jump off the edge of the stage, but it was a lot longer drop than he thought it was, something like 16 feet. feet. So he fractured, dislocated his ankle. Like he did all three ligaments. He needed surgery and a tip plate. Um, he had no pain whatsoever. He laid on the floor, had no pain, went back on stage with someone holding his ankle on. And I can only think that his, his, his dislocation must've been so bad with like no ligamentous support that that person was like, I need to maintain neurovascular supply to his foot. Or I'm going to go on stage with Foo Fighters. Woo! Um, <laughs> but he had no pain. He had no pain when he was on stage playing. Um, it only hurt later when he was in the hospital after about an hour. So, you know, he had a massive amount of threat. And yes, he will have had a lot of cognitive inhibition of his nociception going on. But that nociception was huge. That would have been a massive event. And it's the same as um, when people have battlefield injuries and they have, you know, uh, big big you know explosions and things like that and lose limbs and they don't feel anything because cognitively we are um overloaded with the necessity to survive in that situation Dave Grohl was overloaded possibly with like something intrinsically important to him of the stage percent like the performance the the power and the gravity of the crowd that relationship his awareness was he was so um so massively extraceptive at that point not interceptive that he it's like when you play if you've played a musician musical instrument and I, I did grades on piano and um clarinet and I could play my grade six clarinet but I was thinking about something else I was uh, like out of body experience um he was doing all of that that he didn't have pain so if pain is about threat and that is its purpose and intention he would have had pain at that moment I like that argument. And I think you see that in athletics all the time, right? Where you see like the athletes that can finish the big game or, you know, I think we've all been given examples of that. Hmm. Okay. Good. And Moving I used on. to use that in a different way. I used to use that ex example in a, uh, as a way of explaining for, to patients when the tissue damage doesn't mean pain. Yes. So, you, you know, the, the beautiful thing of Mosley's um, no susception is neither necessary nor sufficient yes. for pain. And I think the same, I think that concept still holds true. Yeah. But I think that what happens, unfortunately, with a lot of the Noi group stuff, because I'm a huge fan mm. of Noi, like I, I've read, I think, all of Laura Mosley's papers. I own all their books. I love their stuff. I do that. I do think that sometimes, especially with social media nowadays, is that we'll see it get watered down mm. or kind of boiled down to the, the most minuscule point. And then that's the point that that's the sticking point for a lot of people. And like that's the phrase that gets repeated. And that's the thing that's easy to remember to tell your patient. And sometimes we miss the big picture and the complexities because it's easier to remember the small little catchphrase that works. And it, it's, it's really well, uh, it's really well put across. They are good educators. They've got that right. And they've got the narrative. They understand. That's why they write the books with the great pictures and they write yeah. patient books as well. Really well. They understand the narrative sells. But that means that we've got this narrative of pain, mm -hmm. which, again, it gives this intentionality. And I think really quickly in when we were going through the predictive processing stuff, um, the biggest shift for me was to go from being like, your brain takes in information, goes, oh, possible damage, oh, gives you pain. Even if it's not an output from the brain, it, it would give you the, the sense of pain to attend to that. You know, pain is a need state. You must attend to me. That's what it says. And I kind of somewhat agree with pain being a need state again, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to have come from something and it doesn't have to have an intentionality to it. It's just an experience that we have. 
We have it when we have damage. We have it when we don't have damage. We have it when we have emotional distress. We have it um, uh, random occurrences. Right. So it, it doesn't have a commonality of an intention. It's not there to do a job. Right. It's not as easy as input equals output. No. And so that, and I think that's the big thing that predictive processing has changed for me and possibly both of us is that that kind of step back of it's not a, there isn't a simple narrative. It is just about your body maintaining homeostasis in lots of different ways. And if we bring this back to GMI, I think GMI was always classically explained as we are going to try to turn down the volume on the sensitization up the spinal cord, and we're going to try to improve the descending modulation to, you know, revert maladaptive neuroplastic strategies that are causing your pain. And now I'm not sure that I believe that as much. I don't think it's as easy as like, we're fixing the up and we're fixing the down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I think that there's like a bajillion little things. Well, this is it. This is what, you know, like mixed courses was painful um, in its complexity, but I now I can now see it in my mind. So when you say that, and when you say like, it's about turning down the sensitization, which we all do in physio, what does, what is that? That's the end of a, a nerve ending before it meets another one in a synapse, releasing one, one going across and one becoming 25 whereas before it would have been maybe one or two yeah um and that that release of extra chemical is based on a predicted model of what is expected to be released and the the nutritional state within that synapse how many receptors so one is released but there are 20 receptors which each produce 25 chemicals you know that that level of how many gates how many channels is a predicted model that is created by the body and um, this is a level of prediction right at a single synapse and what we would be talking about is creating a, a new system where we wouldn't just get a linear i mean it's never linear it's always not linear. 25 000, but we would yeah. be increasing the use of interneurons so other neurons coming in or um improving uh you know doing stuff that makes people feel that better we were talking the other day about vagal tone and the autonomic nervous system and um sympath parasympathetic activity so if we inc improve parasympathetic activity we're going to more likely switch on different elements of the neuroimmune system and immune cells which can then um inhibit at a local synapse level and that itself becomes a new predictive model and if we can have that happen lots and lots and lots it then becomes not just part of the body schema that kind of flexible movable one but it becomes part of the body model yeah. over time and like you know i've lived this um so I, I constantly we're all as humans we're constantly trying to understand our own experience aren't we but you know open heart surgery i had massively perfect interception i don't think it's perfect i think it was hyper vigilant of the whole of my chest wall which took about four years of running and exercising and lifting weights in the gym before it changed. And it really was the exercise that changed it. And I don't get that now unless I have a hospital appointment. Um, so what ha was happening to you? What you would, un you would be uncomfortably aware of um, your heart beating. Yeah. So I, and aware of not just that aware of the whole of the inside sure of all of my ribs and all the way up inside. Like I can, I can tell you exactly the shape. I could draw it, the shape of the inside of my chest wall and how my, sometimes how my organs sit against each other. Um, but because I've got a mechanical heart valve and it ticks like this, um, for the first three or four years, it was painful. Every tick had a sharp edge and it would be slightly painful, which is weird. Mm -hmm. um, and that interception has changed by all of those processes of, inhibition and blah 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 and that wasn't graded motor exercises no. it wasn't like imagined motor components right this was your interoception this was you were working on proprioception and, and proprioception internally yeah and yeah. um, endogenous kind of uh, endorphins and hormonal regulation and psychological regulation processes with you know years and years and years of processing trauma so there's there's so much in this, which is why we don't call GMI GMI. And I think we've both made a massive shift in our understanding of pain. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. It is. We're still, <laughs> we're still kind of going. <clears throat> Normally, a course would give you this for like a day or two, and then you'd 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 kind of kind of amalgamate it. it with what you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then it would be like well, what, like having an interoceptive later. response to it. Yeah. <laughs> 
predictive coding makes me have an interoceptive response. Yeah. I have another question. I have another question. You ready? Yeah. Does the homunculus exist? Ooh. I know I'm being a little bit of a poop disturber. Um, (laughs) I used to know more about this, but I can't remember it. Tell me, tell me the arguments. Explain to me. I think that a lot of the neuroplastic work was discussed around the homunculus. So this is that the sensory motor cortex has kind of little brady representations of our body parts, right? That Mm. seem to be quite well established, right? And in particular, what we found at the pelvic floor is that if someone was so sensitive that you couldn't work on their pelvic floor, work on their foot. Because in the brain, this is next to the genitals, right? So you could do all this foot stuff. Mm. So now I am thinking less and less that like, one particular that the the network of neural processes and I'm going a little bit neural matrixy which call me back but the network of neural processes that that encapsulate a genital sensation or perception might not be so easily isolated to one area in the sensory motor cortex and even the discussion that they had um at the combined sections meeting about Yes, I worked on her, like they had worked on the patient's foot quite a bit, right? But mm-hmm. then they said, but you know what? Have them do recognize for their low back because that might work too. And like the low back is not next to the genitals no, per se, right? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because we know that, you know, all interceptive stuff comes in through the insula. We've got lots of proprioceptive and nociceptive stuff coming through the thalamus, I think. And everything's involved. <laughs> So it's hard to kind of say, but then they they know because they've removed sensory motor cortex SMA1 from rats and stuff. And they've removed, they found people, there are, ex, you know, there are people that don't have them that then have really poor or no ability to find bits of their body or move them. Right. Mick had actually given us a really good example. I know I can't remember what it was, but it was something like that, that there was portions of the, of the cortex that were removed and people could still have sensations and perceptions, right? Yeah. Am I right about and, that? Yeah, and that's and that comes down to this cognitive flexibility. So we know that, and this is where like having, I, we were talking to someone recently about um, some of my mentees. I've gone, I've told to go off and do the Neu group work because it gives you a really gra- good grounding in understanding of the brain. Yeah. Granted, neither of us believe in that model anymore of pain and perception and sensation, whatever. But it gives you a really nice ability to understand stuff like cognitive flexibility because the the concept of a neuro tag built absolutely individually you know and I used to explain it as like I had a patient who would uh she had really raging bladder pain and it was always worse in November September or November when her parents died um her mother when her mother died the anniversary of her mother's death um her mother died of bladder cancer her father also had bladder cancer but had his bladder removed um so her neuro tag could be I was just you know basically seeing a toilet in November you know remembering her mother's pain the emotional trauma whatever all of those parts of memory sight smell of the toilet sensation whatever all occurring if they occur at the same time she would then have in the experience of pain um which I think there is there's something in memory related and environmental stuff but I wouldn't call it like a tag anymore I just say it's like to do with predictive modeling and expectation which is so much more complex and we're into the psych psych zones of um you know memory and I don't know I did go down a point we got so stuck in this course I did try to understand how memories are laid down in cells (laughs) <laughs> but then I decided I wasn't going to be a neuroscientist. Um, There's a all... Pixar movie about it. You should just watch it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, when they were kind of when they were going through the GMI stuff, like, I feel kind of a little bit like that. It was a Pixar GMI. It was an excellent lecture. It wasn't Pixar. It's beyond Pixar. It's much more complex what they presented. But um, they definitely presented the whole kind of you can do anything. But what they looked at was sensory reintegration. It wasn't a specific GMI for the pelvic region, I think. Right. I think they were doing, because they, you know, use your foot, whatever. And there is something, there's definitely something in the fact that you get referral, somatic referral to the inside of the arch of the foot. Um, You know, and if you're an acupuncturist, bladder, uh, spleen six on the inside of the calf, 
and that kind of area does refer to the vagina and there's lots of times I've massaged that or whatever is it because I'm touching them nicely and it feels nice and then I go to the pelvic floor and it, it's not in pain anymore probably there is something about there is a little bit more of a link between the foot and the the vagina and the pelvic floor and vulva than there is you know the head or the shoulder and that region however um is it from a sensory homunculus I don't think so I'm not sure right. And that's where all that smudging talk comes from, right? I think yeah, I need we to... know we've moved beyond smudging, haven't we? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I'm like, I either need to dig back into that research and um, reframe it to be my current understanding of pain, or I need to like move on. <laughs> but I keep oscillating back and forth. So we're basically saying that we don't think it's as clear cut and easily understood as a neural matrix and neuro tags. But again, to be fair, I don't think the Neu group thinks it is either. I think, again, they water it down a little bit more to make it easily digested um, yeah. and to be able to teach the layperson as well. Yeah, and because that's the important bit. At the end of the day, it is important, the stories that we tell our patients. Um, I think they also, I think the last couple of talks that Lorem has been doing, the masterclasses, he's been mentioning um, prediction a lot more, yeah. trying to kind of weave mix model in as well. And we'll see what the new book, I've ordered the new book, it should be here in, you know, six to eight years um, <laughs> when that arrives. I forgot to actually, I need to do that. I should have ordered it from you because it probably would have come to me quicker than it'll get to you. It will probably get to you quicker. Yeah, I think it said three weeks, but um <gasps> that is not how long it takes to get to, to me in rural new brunswick no <laughs> yeah. it's a lot further for them to walk um <laughs> but we'll see what they say there but yeah there, there you know there's a lot and lot of good and it's it's really good to have a new kind of grounding in understanding concepts but I, think I, think, I think it's important i think it's important but we also need to take away i think the intentionality of pain i we've both become philosophers oh, oh i know blame laura she'll love us she's probably, you know, what, she's probably laughing right now but um, she is the bit that now i understand as not helpful and almost a nocebo is that the intentionality of pain that they are reporting so pain is a response to threat to tell you to attend to something or to protect something. The, the fact that pain there has a purpose and an intention a gives a level of responsibility for pain to the person. Yeah. Whereas pain doesn't we care. Are, yeah. Pain maybe, doesn't care. <laughs> your, your brain has made this, you have made this, you will have this, what, why is it doing it? Well, it gets stuck in a cycle, whatever. When, when you step back from that and you see the body as a homeostatic um, organism. Being, organism that is constantly reorganizing and constantly uh, creating predictions to to allow you to then do stuff and then remodeling those predictions at the cellular level between the two synapses um and you know cellular level so i i probably looked at that chocolate bath knowing that we were going to talk about pain and my pancreas started creating insulin um <laughs> it's oh dear it's a pain day um <laughs> When you step back and it, it then just occurs and it doesn't have rhyme nor reason to it, apart from the fact that it's in response to an error within the coding and system, which is so much more gentle to the, to the person suffering in front of you. Okay. So if I'm going to boil this down to how this might be clinically relevant. Yeah. If a clinician's watching this and they're like, all right, this is fantastic. <laughs> Katie and Jilly. I have no idea <laughs> what you guys are messing up my pain delivery for, I think that I would be more inclined to use less of the phrases of like pain is in your brain, mm. pain, you know, um, that we're going to try to trick your brain into improving, remodeling um, the nervous system. I think that I would use language more that saying like there's lots of little connectivities and little outputs and your brain and perception are um, expecting one thing to happen. And that expectation is built on millions of nerve, nervy connections, your previous experiences, um, your current cognitive status, your mood, whether you slept or not. And all of those factors will influence your pain perception. Although I don't know if that's right. Maybe that's, maybe that's too outputty. Is that too outputty? 
It's um, gotten a little bit back out pretty again. Yeah, but I think I think it's almost just a bit complex. I mean, it I don't mind if it's out pretty because it's still sounding okay. Oh, but see, this is what I'm struggling it. with. This is what I'm struggling with because just I, take it back. Just you know, you're um so say someone's got a vestibular dinia, velvodinia, everything yeah. bloody hurts, they can't have sex, they can't do that, it's really sad, they're really sad, they're in pain on the bus all the time to work and back they can't really wear pants and undone the patients we know that are in pain for a long period of time everything's just got wound up you know we're gonna we're gonna work on trying to calm it all down but why does it hurt well, there isn't any problems in the tissues we know that pain can occur on a you know war zone arms and legs blown off without without having Wait. pain pain is an experience um do we say that there's no problems in the tissues hmm there's not there's nothing broken twisted nothing needs surgery yeah. that kind of you know what you've got is really sensitive tissues that it makes sense that if you're a bit sensitive you might think oh there's something going wrong there so I might just stay sensitive just in case sensitive tissues I like because I feel like sometimes when we talk about central sensitization we just gloss over the fact that there can be peripheral sensitization as well yeah and cross I mean? visceral sens sensitization you know someone's yeah. IBS can massively massively um impact their bladder status so you're there tre tre treating them for postmenopausal urgency when it's actually because they've got a very reactive bowel because of their ibs um, yeah. you know and they've got a little bit of vestibular dinia or you know p gas okay. or whatever else going on this is good this is where i struggle because i need to know because i have such a hard time amalgamating all of the information that i can't give my patient a seven hour lecture on nociceptors right I've tried and lost patients because of it. <laughs> oh. Almost lost me in the course, but we, I persevered. Why, why don't they want to listen for 10 hours? <laughs> okay, so this is that we know there is an increased sensitivity to the tissues. Potentially, they, can you say peripherally? Because I think it's almost happening like, or do you not say periphery at all anymore? What does peripheral and central mean? It doesn't mean anything to anyone that's not a clinician unless you've got some awareness. So, uh, you know, you can get sensitized. You just get really sensitive. So if I was explaining bladder pain to a patient, I thought your bladder's got really sensitive and it's it's doing the best it can with the information it's got. But unfortunately, the information it's got and the way it's understood it has been that it's got something to look after and it's got to work on that. So it's doing everything it can. It's using its nerve endings to kind of say, you're you're getting a bit full, but it's actually asking more nerves to say that. So instead of one nerve, you've got the whole of Cardiff City Stadium shouting, you're a little bit full, which sounds louder than just one person. And it's got, it's, it's stationed its um, immune cells and it's, you know, soldier cells that are ready to fight anything off. All of this means that you've, it's just a bit sore. And what we're going to do is calm that down. And at the same time, the kind of your brain regions that are responsible for the bladder, you don't have to say what they do. And the brain region responsible for bladder, I mean, that's a very questionable statement itself. Right. Um, <laughs> but the brain regions that are responsible for the bladder are all a little bit um, heightened and they're a bit sensitive. So you've just got a constant, you know, constant whole system. So we've got to work with this and we've got to work with the tissues. Um, I think that I'm everything down. So that sounds like the talk that we're accustomed to given, giving. Yeah. And I think that my discomfort with um, how I've heard it given before is that sometimes it's like, it's very easy to say, we've, we know there's nothing actually wrong with the tissues and it's all yeah. in your brain. And that's, yeah. and do you know what I mean? So how you worded it, it was slightly different than saying that. And I think that it's a subtle difference, but I think that that makes patients feel more comfortable because they can understand that like nerves are more sensitive in an area. And when we say there's yeah. nothing wrong in yeah. the periphery at all there's nothing wrong with the tissues at all i feel like that's almost like mm, i don't want them to feel like they're not being validated um, no, and that we're telling them it's evidence on the of that as well a lot of people need evidence so it's about how you how you say wrong and how you use language so there's nothing wrong in common parlance um means there isn't a tumor you know what do people worry about i'm i've got have i got bladder cancer have i you know have i got cancer of my vulva have i got an a std um, a rash, a fissure. A, yeah, it's yeah. something cut. There's nothing cut, twisted, infection. Nothing surgery. It's not infected in that kind of way. But you you are super sensitive and you know, I can see that. Wow, a, a medical professional can see something. Yeah, because when I touched you afterwards, you became really red really quickly. And that shows me that actually, for some reason, you're so sensitive that as soon as I touched you, your blood vessels open up. Like, that's cool, isn't it? And that tells me that whole area is like on alert waiting for something to happen and it's on alert the whole time but you know what you can't live on alert 
we're going to teach it to calm down and it only needs to go on alert when you've got you know thrush well played julie yeah and, that, and <laughs> i learned that from um julie ellis if she she will never watch this because she will be tap dancing and playing tennis is <laughs> julie um is a wonderful wonderful women's health physio um who also has a lot of life and i love her and every time i talk to her she trolls me about how little life i do um, to stop well, that's your work. human being, not human doing, right? Exactly. So every time I text her, she says, oh, sorry, just getting out of the gym. Oh, sorry, just getting out of my tap class. Oh, sorry, just walking for 18 miles, just doing that. Um, but she taught me to stop complicating it. You know, if people are interested in pain, you can, and if they have a genuine interest, you can send them places to go, um, send them to all the YouTubes and all the rest of it that we use. Uh, and you can talk to them about it. But if, but you've got to think, you know, the level of understanding that people are at is less than high school with their bodies, let alone with understanding pain when something's scary. I usually say that the nerves and the nervous system have become a little bit sensitive. Or is that too yeah. complicated? Do you no, think that's, that's okay? okay? Yeah, people understand nerves. Like think about think about the first two years of your high school education. Yeah. You know, common what 12 to 14 read average reading age. Um, what we understand then even you know my husband's lived with me for many years we've been together 14 15 years he's got excellent medical knowledge in many ways and also absolute none <laughs> so he doesn't do anything medical um and we we overcomplicate I think because we're into it but it doesn't yeah. mean that we we don't need to understand it because then it means right. that the stories that we say to people are um less nocebos yes less nocebic is that a word uh, sure, I will grant you permission to make that word. <laughs> I feel like I need some more chocolate now. Go on then. So I I was scanning through pain, like, yeah, the notes I made from this, course, this six months, of course, about purinergic and peptidergic receptors and B4 positive or R2X3 negative and positive purinergic receptors and blah, 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 blah. But we still make handmade, handwritten notes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Um, uh, it goes in my brain better if I make hand notes, but I found something that I really like about neural right. crosstalk. Yes. It has an impact on the redistribution and of the receptor and the re type of receptor channels along the neuron. So nerves that talk to each other in different um, viscera, however, you get an increase in channels along the afferent fibers. So mm -hmm. the channels um, in all of them from A delta to C, you get an increase in sodium, potassium and calcium receptor channels. So it's more easy to fire the nerve. You get more ectopic. You get an increase in adrenal receptors, which means we get an increase over reception of the adrenaline as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a state where you get neural crosstalk between fibers that are firing lots, whatever, all of them upregulate mm -hmm. all of them. And then you get more of a reception of adrenaline. So if you're in a fearful state or in a pain state or in a stressed situation you're going to get an up an up regulation in that neural firing as well um duh, 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 duh. and nerve damage and peripheral inflammation initiates a cascade of events that results in neurochemical functional and anatomical plasticity where we get surprisals surprisals like error so central sensitization is probably a way of updating the model to deal with this surprisal yes but it's an it's is in a, an ineffective way? No, so that's not because that again, I feel almost has too much intention behind it. Do you know what I mean? It's just the body's not. It's just yeah, it's just doing what it needs to do in order yeah. to run the model better. Yeah. So there's, I think, what I said to you the other day that it's a bit like um, anthrop anthropomorphizing animals when you yeah. start saying, "Oh, that that squirrel, look, it's missed its friend. Oh, it's sad," and it's he like needs no. a little cap and a book bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they <laughs> they the characters. Thing. That kind of stuff when we give them emotions when actually um it's almost thinking of the body as a computer yeah. homeostasing but then yeah. overlaying the levels of emotion and endocrine function yeah um so central sensitization is a way of adapting to understand error yes within your body schema or your predictive model yes i agree and I think, you know, the more that we talk about this, the more that like those simple narrative statements that we it comes down to. I mean, like there is how many hours of this course? There are probably like seven, eight hours a week. for 40. It was 48 hours. Really? Uh, yeah. So I did say it was a good. weekend course. <laughs> 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 weekend course over eight weeks. Yeah. Um, 
We did not meant the entire weekend. <laughs> Uh, oh, I've highlighted stuff and I just don't understand what it means now. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm trying to think where do you want to go from here? I don't know if we need to. Yeah, that might, that was an hour. Yeah. Anyone watching this video might be sick of us by now. Yeah. Our own brains. I don't know if you want to break it down into bits. I'm not, I'm less... Anatomy and distribution, parallel processing, difficult to show on diagrams. Oh, it's a diagram chat. <laughs> Back away. <laughs> you know what I didn't understand? The what? free energy principle. Oh, that's pretty easy off the top of my head. You don't ever want there to be free energy in the system. So you're- Everything should be efficient enough that it's always being used? Yeah. Okay. At, at right. base level, to you, you're trying to remove the free energy, and you apply but it. But isn't power. fat free energy? Fat. Yeah, like isn't fat storage potential energy? I guess <laughs> maybe because it's not free, maybe because it's potential. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that has a per that has a purpose within a system and a cycle. Right. I mean, like, yeah. In general but it, yeah the energy with any within any system it likes to be balanced because you don't want to carry too much fat you don't want to have too much free energy that you have to use in a different cycle right you also and we're not talking just about energy in the say in the sense of of chemical energy used for um motion function we're talking about energy and any you know in heat in the energy output of Oh, the transfer of any way, any energy, transduction, community, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, the body is always trying to limit the misuse of energy chemically. In an effort to be efficient, is that so? And yeah. in an effort to be efficient and to maintain some sort of amount of homeostasis, correct? Yeah. The best form of homeostasis and efficiency is um, minimizing free energy. Okay. If you create right. lots of free energy, you've got to do something with it then. So it has cycles to do that. The body has ways of laying down sugar, fat, other excesses that may be useful later. It has ways of, you know, when you make excess water, you get rid of it through your kidneys. And I think that this type of model that I understand, but when it comes to pain, I'm not sure that I understand it as well. Oh, I did at one point. <laughs> you'd okay. have to give me, you'd have to give not me a week to run today. up. It's okay, not important for today. Yeah, not for today. We could do a week's run up before we go through the energy <laughs> principle. Um, it'll be in here somewhere, just. Decreasing free energy minimizes prediction error. That's what I know. <laughs> yes, because if um, the prediction and the sens sensory information and the come in perception are the same, there's no energy loss. I think so. Okay. I think you're right. <laughs> it came down to lots of physics. Um, and There's I do understand it, but give me, yeah, give me a week's run up and I could probably explain that one better, but I think it, yeah. Okay. Mar my so you explain Markov blankets to me. Yeah. <laughs> Markov washing machines. That's I'm still not sure time. that I believe that I need to know about Markov blankets, but I'm still not sure. But I will say, I think this all boils down to the fact that when people say graded motor imagery and they talk about the pelvic floor, oftentimes they're talking about explicit motor in imagery because they're not doing laterality and they're not doing true mirror work in the sense of how the Neu group had originally intended it. I think that we're updating our language for use with patients because we're not gonna say pain is 100% in the brain anymore. And any other take home that I'm missing? Uh, and that, but pain. Oh, Pain, what is pain? What's pain, Jillian? <laughs> well, Bill explained it to his students, apparently. Um, pain did exists, yeah, I asked him on his recent course, did you actually explain pain then? And he was like, yes, I did. Um, he, uh, I would I would say that pain is, pain is in the error, so. Um, wait, you pain is in the it. error. Okay, yeah. good, pain that's is, it, I'm, I'm getting, making catchphrases. <laughs> yeah. Pain is an embodied experience mm -hmm. um, born of prediction error. Millions and millions and millions of predictions, right? Millions of them, and they're hierarchical. They can be predictions of how much 
glucose is going to transfer or how often you're expecting it to fire across the synapse. It can be um, your previous experience with the situation. It can be like as meta as that, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, to, to whole body function, what you're, yeah, all the way up the systems in that generative hierarchical model. We like those words of the system everywhere, constant, constant predictions, constant understanding, and it's within your tissues. If your hand hurts, your hand is hurting. The hurt is in your hand. Yes, there are brainy representations and there are things going on here um, that are registering that your hand is hurting as an input and that may be to do with how you have generated or how a pain perception, a pain understanding has been generated, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's due to this. And, but we can do top down treatment methods mm -hmm. that can alleviate this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's what we're interested in, but it's not graded motor imagery. It's interceptive training. It's mapping. It's graded exposure psychologically and phys physiologically. Yeah. That's not catchy though. <laughs> right. We're going to find some words that will, will make it better. I think we should put all our words in a hat. <laughs> That might be how we solve this by the end of your PhD. Yeah. I like that it's a we in my PhD. <laughs> that's helpful. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's as far as I think I can go today with pain. Okay, I think so um, too. I think we did a good job. Yeah. Sorry Next, if we I'll confused anyone. Them. Yeah, I think um, anyone watching the, the APTA CSM chat about GMI, it, it simplified it and kind of saying you can do any sensory stuff and it'll make your brain work a bit better um and i think my original my initial response was oh why am i getting so wound up about this why am i talking about it for years like this is a lot more simple than i need to make it i don't need to make it any more complicated which is absolutely fine um and i've gone away with it and thought about it a bit and i think i'm in the same place as you when actually there, there are still too many questions. It was a yeah. really, really good, solid, well evidenced basis for understanding it. Um, it was an introduction. It was an introduction. Yeah, right? it was a good introduction to it. Um, and I think where you and I are is we're a lot further down the road. Um, in oh, even saying little words is really hard. <laughs> You can hear my brain working, trying to, you know, because just so much information, 48 hours of lectures about pain and blah, blah, blah. I know. Um, Wait till you hear my chat with Laurie. I sound like an idiot. I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. No, or it is, it's so, the more you know, the harder it is to talk, the harder yeah. it is. Well, that was evident. <laughs> you are, and that is because you are a clear big brain. So... Mm -hmm. That yeah, the difficulty we're having is actually we have so many more questions that um, there are just interpretations and we're inferring stuff. And my my confidence and my knowledge has been shooketh. Yes, yeah. Which is thing is that in within within that in like your what we've done is we've pushed ourselves to discomfort and it's within the discomfort that the best growth is made and the best struggling forward. So we've done a really good thing, but it's definitely put both of us in this place where we're just really really uncomfortable yeah. um in in explaining or understanding anything what but do you call this you call this the hackles Ugh. yeah yeah your hackles are up <laughs> oh hackles that's where i'm at yeah so we're there so from a gmi point of view there are too many questions to in, uh, to just infer that you can do mirror work with someone and it helps them because of whatever um yeah. we can't put those intentions into our actions and what we really want, what you and I are desperately wanting is intentions and understanding because yeah. why we do something is very important to, to then understanding why it should work. Yeah. Okay. We've gone round and round and round. We'll stop recording now. <laughs> Marvellous. Join us for the next time that we get our brains around. We've bored you to death. Yeah. <laughs>